Hello, everybody, and welcome to this presentation on Autodesk Fusion Generative for Manufacturing. My name is Mike Fiedler, and with me also is Apollo Vanderberg. We are simulation specialists here at Autodesk, and uh, we're going to walk you through today's presentation. So without wasting any more time, let me get into the slides here. Just a little bit of an overview about uh, what we will cover today, the welcome portion, which we are doing right now. We are going to explain a little bit about what is generative design manufacturing, and we will give a brief demo of the software. We'll talk a little bit about next steps, and then, of course, we'll leave plenty of time for question and answer, which is maybe the, the most interesting part of it all, to hear from you. Um, anything that we can clarify about the software and uh, perhaps how you can leverage it in your environment. So what I would say about this uh, before we get going on it is, you know, the first portion here, we're going to talk about what it is. So uh, you may have heard about it. You may have seen some images that come out of it. Uh, perhaps you've even explored it a little bit yourself. Uh, we want to focus on how the program can uh, help you with your workflow. And uh, so, you know, we're going to start out with some slides here about why you might utilize it in the first place. So perhaps somebody said, hey, this is something from Autodesk, you know, check it out, uh, see if we can use it. So hopefully when we go through the slides here, uh, that'll help answer those questions about whether it is something that you can even add into your workflow. And then from there, I'm going to hand it off to Apollo, and Apollo is going to go through a demo of the software so you can see how uh, easy it is to utilize and some of the steps that would be required to utilize it. And then, you know, once you've seen what it can do and, and how things get done with the software, then, of course, we have the opportunity for next steps. Where do you go from here after this webinar uh, if it is something that you want to utilize? And then, of course, you know, if there's anything that came up during the presentation, anything that uh, maybe caused you some to have some questions, then certainly we'll have plenty of time to, to answer those. So moving along here, first of all, uh, I'd like to address the question, why do we care about generative design, right? So, you know, there are certain products out there. Um, I, I'm thinking about a few from some other vendors. You know, there's, um, well, no, I don't want to name any names, but um, there are a lot of products that I utilize in my my day-to-day -day working. I'm in simulation, I utilize generative design. I use an awful lot of Microsoft products. Microsoft, you know, another company that has a lot of products and, and almost daily I would say I use Microsoft Word, I use Microsoft Excel and PowerPoint, but there are also a lot of products that I don't utilize, right? Um, either because I don't care, I don't need them for my workflows or maybe I don't know what they do, right? So let's start right here with generative design and, and why maybe to care about it. On the left-hand side, uh, you see one of the first stories that came out from generative design, and that was uh, from General Motors and this, this seatbelt bracket assembly. And what it was is a, a multi-part assembly, and generative design was utilized here to consolidate that into uh, a single component. Well, you know, it's a two-fold motivator, really, uh, as the bullet points say. One, it's optimizing for mass, so we can take these parts and, and hopefully lightweight it as we apply generative design to it. And then second of all, of course, we take those, those parts and re we reduce it to a single component. So we reduce supply chain costs associated with the part and its unique supplier, rather than potentially having to keep track of uh, you know, multiple suppliers and, and when do we get those parts in, hopefully in a just-in-time fashion, if we only have a single component that we need to worry about, well, that greatly simplifies everything, right, besides just the light weighting. And then on the right-hand side there, um, what we have there is a, a wheelchair and some components of it um, have been generatively designed there. So, you know, what, what are the benefits there? Well, it allows to help lightweight the chair so that it takes the least amount of effort to move around, obviously. Any time we can remove mass, that would be beneficial for the user. And then additionally, making parts interchangeable 
allows each person to make them unique to their personal dimensions as well as their distinct preferences, right? So to a degree, it can be tailored and customized uh, as the, the person grows. Uh, then of course, some, some different parts can be generatively designed to, to accommodate that as well. All right. So what is it overall? Well, Autodesk Generative Design is a design exploration technology. It allows you to simultaneously generate multiple CAD-ready solutions based on real-world manufacturing constraints and product performance requirements. And we're gonna dig into that a little bit more. And some of the key uh, factors out of that statement are real-world manufacturing constraints. So the manufacturing constraints are one of the inputs to the program. You can say that this is going to be 3D printed or it's going to be CNC machined. Um, and there are a number of manufacturing constraints as you will see that can be leveraged. So that is one of the inputs to the program. So as it comes up with solutions, um, you'll know whether it's manufacturable or not. And then uh, of course you have your performance requirements. Part of the input to the program are going to be what constraints do you have uh, how is it able to move? What are the loads? Is it just gravity? Are there forces? Are there moments? Uh, and then the structural integrity of the solutions are also validated during the solution process. So, and then our next thing that we're gonna take a look at is how does it help the product development process? Well, let's take a look at a, a classic uh, product development process saying that you're starting from scratch. You have an idea you need to solve a problem. You're gonna create a product that solves this problem. Initially, you come up with a certain number of concepts and that could be you know, a single person that is tasked with this, this problem of, of coming up with some sort of solution. Um, and then you know, once you say, you know, out of these six, eight concepts that I've come up with, uh, we need to validate it and make sure what, that it's manufacturable, that it's strong enough, uh, that the cost to produce it is going to be within reason. And then we know sometimes you run into barriers along the way, right? You say it's, it's a great idea, but it's gonna cost too much. So you have to go back to a new concept. And again, you test it, you evaluate it. And there's this back and forth iterative process until ultimately uh, you come to a particular design that you can produce. So there's a fairly long iteration phase and a fairly long uh, process from design to, to production. And you come up with something like the, maybe the motorcycle swing arm that you see here on the, on the right hand side, okay? So how does using generative design help you out in the process? Right out of the gate, you get multiple validated manufacturable options. So this is really the bulk of what generative design uh, is here to help with. So uh, you're going to tell it, these are the different ways that this can be manufactured. These are the different loads that it needs to be able to withstand. These are the materials that I am able to leverage. And then the program outputs for you, you know, multiple options. So from there, you already know that they are manufacturable. You know that they can withstand the loads. And so then you can take your design and produce the design. So it therefore shortens up the iteration phase and design production phase. And on the right hand side, you can see what that swing arm might look like utilizing generative design, right? So uh, pretty different <laughs> as far as the outcome is concerned. Um, but the, the key here is really, you know, Obviously the outcomes are, are kind of neat, kind of interesting, uh, visually interesting, uh, but the goal here is really to shorten up the iteration phase and to shorten up the design to production phase so that you get outcomes that are, are faster, uh, you get to the outcomes faster and hopefully maybe uh, lighter weight even along the way. All right, so this shows you some productivity increase because we took out a lot of the back and forth iterations. All right, so just to look at a comparison next, uh, what is the difference between topology optimize, optimization and generative design? You may have heard of topology optimization. In fact, it is currently available within Fusion itself. It's also available within uh, the Inventor program. So we'll first, by talking, first start by talking uh, about what topology optimization is with an analogy to the transportation industry. 
So imagine that you have a shipping route, and this is analogous to your part, right? Currently, maybe you produce a part, and you know that, you know, to get from raw material to the end of it, you take a certain route or a path going from, from A to B. What topology optimization does is it says, okay, here's this part that we're starting with, where can I remove material? So that would be analogous to maybe finding a different route from A to B. So in the transportation analogy, what you're doing is you're, you're moving the same amount of material, but faster, right? You found a, a faster route, you go through the Panama Canal, 60% faster, uh, great. And that, that would be analogous to topology optimization. We, st we use the same part or same idea that we initially had. We're just removing material, uh, but have the same design, right? Um, but to expand upon that, what generative design does for you, uh, it still will do the same thing. So you could start with a part and you can figure out how to make a lighter part. Uh, but then it also adds in different means. So in the transportation analogy, that would be, what if we explore a truck route? What if we explore a train route? What if we explore uh, sending this by, by plane? So these different modes of transportation, right? They have different speeds that they can go. They have a different cargo carrying capacity. There's different costs associated with them and there's different uh, securities associated with them. And in the end, we could plot these out and we find what is the appropriate balance for us. In terms of generative design, what we're doing is we're giving it different manufacturing methods. Again, you know, is it unrestricted? Is it 3D printed? Um, is it going to be CNC machine, for instance? We're going to give it different materials that it can study, right? And then based on those different outputs, we're going to get different plots and we could determine, you know, this is the weight and the strength that I'm looking for. Um, and, and and ultimately choose a, a design that is appropriate for what you're trying to do. One of the other questions that we wanted to answer is Apollo and I were putting this together, you know, first we started with, well, why use it? You know, it's a real product. Uh, people are using it today to make different parts that are lighter, that are maybe manufactured in different ways than they had leveraged before. Um, so we answered that question, but then we said, well, when? When are people going to apply generative design, really? Uh, you know, is it for a new company that is just getting started? Is it for a company that's been around a long time and already has a lot of designs already figured out? The answer is yes to both of those, really. So we're going to give you a couple uh, examples here when you might leverage it, right? So certainly new product design is um, a, uh, an application when you could leverage generative design. So maybe you are in the business of creating new designs, new geometries, that would be an excellent time to utilize generative design. So generative design can help you to figure out where is the material needed? What types of materials might I want to utilize and how much of it do I need? And then it allows you to explore design alternatives beyond human imagination. So if you think back to that motorcycle swing arm that we looked at just a few slides back, right? Uh, I'd be willing to bet that most of us wouldn't think of that type of outcome uh, that generative design came up with, right? Um, so it helps to produce maybe things that we don't classically think of uh, as mechanical engineers or designers. You know, we tend to have a, a very linear thought process. Uh, here's a connection point and here's where my load is and, and let me uh, add some sort of bar stock between those two points, for instance, right? And generative design is not necessarily constrained by those same means of, of thinking. Um, so uh, anytime you're coming up with a new product design, that would be a great time to utilize generative design. Part consolidation. So we talked about that general motor seat belt bracket, right? So if you have assemblies and right now uh, maybe there are pain points with those assemblies. I don't want to say difficulties, but maybe some, some pain points, right? Because they're costly. Maybe they're hard to manufacture. Maybe there's a, a lot of steps involved in that uh, manufacture of that assembly. You know, one person puts a couple 
parts together in a tray and it goes down, the next person in the assembly process gets to bolt a, a couple of those components together and then you know it goes on to the next person and the next person in the process adds another part or two and then the next person you know maybe does some spot welding or some secondary processes from there. So if you can do part consolidation by taking this this assembly and reducing it down or portions of it down to a, a single component, uh, then certainly that will help your process, right? And then the third one, certainly not to be discounted, uh, if you have been producing parts for quite a while, uh, perhaps you can use generative design on some of these current existing designs of yours to figure out, well, how do we enhance them? Can we lightweight them? Uh, can we increase the structural integrity? Can we extend the durability? What about exploring different materials? It'll allow you to explore different materials or different manufacturing methods, perhaps, that haven't been considered uh, to date, right? And that's certainly one reason that, that I would look at using uh, generative design. And also, maybe, uh, maybe this is a good entry point for you, right? You could take in a design, and you know how that design operates. You know that it probably works well for your company. Uh, run it through generative design, see maybe how you could alter that design. Where can you remove material? Okay. Um, so the next thing we're gonna take a look at or, or area that we're gonna focus on are some of the outcomes. Uh, we talked about what it can do for you. Um, you know, when you input these different materials, when you input these different manufacturing methods, uh, what is the outcome of the program? Well, you know, ultimately, what we're looking to do is strike the right balance between the performance of the part and the cost to produce it. So both of these go into the program and are able to be seen in the outcomes of the program. So we know that everybody is limited in the time and energy that you can spend on any design problem to explore all the options, right, that encompass the design space. That is, you know, what are all the potential outcomes? So that's, that's really one of the things that the program is good at, producing all these different outcomes for you so that you don't need to spend all the time thinking about what might be the possible solutions to the problem. And then once you have these different outcomes, again, you weigh the performance and the cost to produce and, and choose one that is, is ideal uh, for your situation. And again, so what we're gonna focus on here are what are the costs to produce and, and what is the performance of the parts? So again, let's use a, a simple analogy to explain this in terms of transportation, in this case, cars, right? Uh, we all have seen you know, different car commercials or been to car lots. Uh, maybe some of us are interested in, in car magazines. So we know there's, there's tons of different cars out there, right? Uh, and they have different levels of performance. And of course, they have different costs to produce them. So at one end of the spectrum, you have some very high cost, high performance cars and at the other end of the spectrum, you have some lower cost, lower performing cars. And then again, multiple um, vehicle choices along that spectrum and, and some right in the middle there that are maybe middle cost and, and uh, it, you know, as far as uh, their performance, they perform well. So, you know, depending on what your company is looking to produce, uh, then you determine where along this spectrum you're going to pull your solution from. And again, generative design is going to produce a lot of outcomes for you. And then you can evaluate those different outcomes and decide where you want to be along that spectrum. So let's take a look at an example that is maybe more uh, engineering related. So this is the crowdsourced um, GE bracket challenge that was out a few years ago. And the interesting thing from this challenge is that many hundreds of designs were created, right? And the company said, these are where this, this geometry is constrained, the existing geometry in the upper left there. This is where it's constrained in these four bolt holes. And then they provided people with different loads that it needed to withstand. So it had uh, horizontal loads and vertical loads and off axis loads, as well as some moments. Uh, and then they put it forth to the user community and said, you know, produce for us some designs, or if you were to design this, what would that look like? Uh, and the community delivered on that, right? So there were 
many, many outputs and all of them satisfy the requirements, but they all have different costs to produce and they have different materials and processes and, and other design parameters. So if we lay them out along this curve, it might look like you know, this kind of distribution. So of course the challenge for any individual team within your company, if you just think about, well, how many engineers would I assign to this task or designers would I assign to this task, right? In general, we don't have access to hundreds of people that we can say, I need all of you to think about, you know, different outcomes. How would we design this differently? So that would be, you know, if you just gave that same task to a single person or just a few people and said, I need you to produce a hundred different outcomes of this, that would take weeks, months, years. How long would it take? I don't know. Uh, and again, so that's one of the, the times that you can employ generative design. Generative design is going to quickly produce all of these outcomes for you. Okay. To be honest, sure, it might take an hour, it might take a few hours for it to compute all these, these different outcomes, but several hours versus multiple weeks. Uh, if you could even think of, you know, with the one, two, three people that you assign to this, if you could even think of all these different outcomes uh, with the group that you have available to assign to it. So again, you know, the program is going to produce all these different outputs for you, and then you need to you know, weigh which one is, is best for your particular application. And speaking about, you know, weighing which one is best, when we get to the outcomes of the program, it's gonna show you the outcomes in, in several different ways. And Apollo will show this in detail a little bit more uh, as we move along here, but um, you're gonna get visual outputs of them so you can see what they look like visually and some of them will be you know visually interesting and maybe some of them you just go well that one's just going to be way too heavy or it's not visually appealing for what we want to do uh, and then you can also look at different tables like we see here so we're looking at uh, in this particular chart estimated manufacturing cost uh, versus the manufacturing method and these are all different outputs from the program so we can see the range of cost associated with all these different outcomes uh, and you can toggle them to different things, like maybe I want to plot the manufacturing cost versus mass in this case, or you can plot uh, the weight of them versus um, the strength of it, for instance, or the displacement of it, for instance. And then down at the bottom, you can see the, the legend here. So this was uh, in blue, the, the two, ax cut, two axis cutting method, and then a two and a half axis milling, three axis milling, five axis unrestricted die casting and, and additive. So the program came, comes up with all these different outputs. And again, you can determine, you know, and, and drill in. Maybe I'm interested in, in something down uh, in the lower left-hand corner here. I, I need it to be a low cost part. And I also want the, the mass of it to be um, relatively low. Or maybe you can go with something that's a little higher mass because you're not too worried about the weight, but you still want the cost to be relatively low. So we have also partnered, I should mention, with, with a priori. Uh, and you can, as part of the setup of the program, say, I'm going to produce maybe 2,500 of these parts, or I'm going to produce 5,000 of these parts. And that's how you arrive at these, these different ranges of cost for the different manufacturing methods as well. Okay. Let me go ahead and move on to the next slide. Uh, and I'll let Apollo pick up here. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mike. And so, yeah, as Mike mentioned, right, you know, there's a, def a number of different reasons why we might get into to generative design. And so kind of uh, as, a, as a use case, I'm taking that third one, right? So as Mike mentioned, to might be your first entry point, maybe a part enhancement. Um, and so the typical workflow is, you know, starting with that CAD, right? So we have some sort of assembly that might be driving the existing design. Um, you know, there will be some sort of uh, projected geometries, some sort of pre-work that we need to help better define the problem itself. Um, so a little bit of CAD work that might be needed and then the actual problem definition. So what are all those different uh, load cases that we're going to look at? What are all the different materials that we're interested in, in exploring? And then, you know, more so, what are the different manufacturing methods that we'd like to see? Um, and then we'll let the, the program generate this, uh, all the different outcomes. And then lastly, the, the critical side of actually exploring all of those outcomes. Um, so kind of being able to compare, you know, as Mike was showing in that, um, you know, explore graph, 
you know, what's the cost, what's the mass, what's the displacement, and kind of comparing between all of them. Um, so if we go to the next slide, you know, as we talk about manufacturing methods, uh, you know, we have a number of different manu manufacturing methods that we can uh, account for. So uh, obviously there's a, an unrestricted, so kind of just letting the program do what it needs to do to produce a part that will accommodate all of those um, low cases but we can also restrict it to to a given manufacturing method. So whether that's additive, uh, die casting, three and five axis, two and a half axis, and two axis. And so, you know, a lot of these are are, are you know continually evolving. Um, you know, many of these didn't exist just even a couple months ago. So um, it's something that we are you know continuing to strive and, and make sure that uh, as we as we put out a manufacturing method that it can be a validated manufacturing method and, and be accounted for, you know, in the outcome that's produced or in the geometry itself. Um, so on this next slide, what I have is a, a quick video walkthrough that I'll talk to and, and then I'll actually open up Fusion here on my side for, for the Q&A if you want to dive into any specific uh, details with it. So, you know, starting with the assembly, you know, you know we're kind of going to look at this lower suspension A-arm. Um, and break it out. And so, kind of as I mentioned, you know, from Fusion, you know, we step into the generative design workspace where we can make any sort of model edits required for the purpose of generative design. Um, so we're going to come in and make a couple things for, you know, mounting locations, uh, where we're going to assign loads, uh, but also keep out regions or or avoidance regions. You know, this suspension has to have a range of motion, and we don't want it to to rotate into other components. Um, so, for example, here I'm going to draw a box, and that's going to represent some of the chassis that that we might be rotating about. Um, you know, there's definitely going to be some bolts and and you know mounting. So, you know, maybe we have to account for the bolts or even tool access to these locations. Um, once we have that done, we can kind of go into now our our definition of what those components are. And so, um, the three you know, main critical areas are, are where the suspension mounts to the chassis, the wheel, and since this is the front suspension, you know, for, uh, you know, the, the you know, turning. And so those are going to be preserves. Everything else are avoidance regions. So we, we want to keep geometry out of that segment. Um, everything in between is, is the open space that the solution can be, you know, um, investigated. So we're going to set up through different uh, loads, through different constraints, you know, are we going under braking, acceleration? You know, maybe we're doing a turning. Um, all the different load cases that that suspension AR might exist. And then what's our objectives? So are we trying to minimize mass? Are we trying to maximize stiffness? What's our safety factor? Um, but then more importantly, what are the manufacturing methods we want to look at? So you know, we have the ability for unrestricted. Uh, we can do you know the three and five axis kind of as I mentioned two and a half axis two axis cutting, um, adding all of these details in as well as details around the tool itself. You know what's the tool diameter you want to look at? What's the length uh, that it can reach? What materials do we want to test for? Um, you know do we want to explore new materials that we haven't traditionally looked at? If it, if typically it was a steel component, we want to lightweight it into something aluminum um, or or more expensive like magnesium. Um, you know, maybe we're trying to print it and, and kind of use, you know, specialized materials there. So we have the ability to do a pre-check and then go ahead and generate our, our solution set. Um, and then here, this is where the, we start exploring, just start looking at it visually, trying to understand which ones we like. We can isolate based on manufacturing method. Um, we can use the toggles to kind of filter down, you know, based on a given mass or displacement target that we'd like to, to look at. Um, you know, we can view things in table format. So if you want to sort, you know, in ascending or descending order on, on, on the mass and kind of rank them in that capacity or, or based on the material and kind of group them. Uh, but more importantly, a lot of times we kind of come into the, the graph itself and be able to visually look at the entire data set and say, you know, where are they? What's the, in this case, mass versus displacement? And maybe there's a region that we are interested in. Um, you know, picking two, which represent in this case different color, uh, different materials. Um, you know, let's compare them side by side and see how how the design varies. You know, where is mass concentrated as a result of the material? Um, you know, that's there, and and then even you know, what's the stress concentrations? Um, you know, to the to the part itself. Uh, we can highlight 
all the different uh, geometry that we had initially. Um, so if you want to look at uh, those preserves and avoidance regions, you know, we can toggle those on to see how well it honored those, those requirements. Um, and then you know, lastly, once we have a part that we like, uh, we can actually dive in and we can promote that. Um, so we can promote that back into Fusion and, and start using that for our design and take it into the rest of, of Fusion's capabilities. So if you want to go into further validation within Fusion Simulation or you want to do some you know, further rendering on it within you know, the rendering space, uh, you have that ability because now you have a, a fully functioning CAD model. Um, it's, it's a full B-Rep that you get out of it. And um, it's kind of the, the workflow in a nutshell. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, Mike. You know, one thing that does come up before I kind of I end on the last two things here is, you know, a lot of things that we tend to show, you, you might kind of think it's always going to be, you know, industrial applications or it's going to be, um, you know, a, a different form of a bracket. And, and you know, realistically, uh, there are a lot of different industries that are diving into general design. Um, you know, we, we kind of span into almost even industrial design at times with things like the lampshade um, or even the, the connector that's on the bottom right for a, kind of like a coat rack. Uh, but, but, you know, we do get into a lot of also um, automotive parts with you know, brake calipers and the swing arm that, that's kind of shown there. Um, so there is a wide range of, of applications that can be done with generative design. It's just a matter of um, maybe taking a step back and thinking about you know how you want to apply it and and what those preserve regions or avoidance regions for that use case might be so you know from there you know a lot of times the question is well what's next you know if, if this is interesting if there's something you want to dive in deeper on you know what do we do and that and how do we we do that and you know thankfully with with fusion you know there are a tremendous amount of resources that, that we have available um, for you to be able to do that and um, I'll kind of comment on two things. One, at the end of this webinar, as we close out, you will be prompted with a, an immediate survey. I'll ask two or three questions um, around the survey or around the, the webinar itself. Um, one of them specifically is, are you interested in us reaching out to you? Um, so if it is something that you'd like to dive into, you'd like to, to you know, have further discussions on, please feel free to answer yes on that one and, and we will connect with you and um, have maybe a little bit more of a one-on-one -on -one discussion around what your interests are and how we can best, you know, help move you forward. Um, as well, uh, Mike, if you go to the next slide, uh, we do have workshops that are available, um, one-day and two-day workshops. Um, and so we, you know, have a link down here that, you know, feel free to, to go to if you'd like to, to leverage that. As well, if you want to say, you know, yes in that survey, um, we can absolutely uh, connect you with uh, Graham, who kind of runs our, our workshop out of our Birmingham Technology Center. Um, really useful uh, event where we kind of dive into um, a number of different things, uh, not just with the workflow, but talking about different business case uh, business cases, and in some instances, collaborating you know between you and maybe some other peers of a of a similar industry. Um, so if any of that's of interest, feel free to to either go to the the website that you see here or you know say yes at the, the end of the survey and we'll uh, we'll connect you um at this time though i will uh i will steal sharing and uh, we'll open it up for for q a um so if there is any question that anybody has that you'd like to to ask feel free to type it into the q a panel um and we will be happy to to answer them And I will answer uh, just for everybody else, since there was a question during the, the webinar about if this was being recorded. Um, it is being recorded and it will be posted back on uh, the, the main mechanical engineering uh, webinar page that you used to sign up for this webinar.
So uh, we have a couple of questions asking around uh, sharing the presentation or a demo or a video that can be shared. Um, as far as the, the PowerPoint itself, I, I can't say that we've been asked that previously. Um, I, can, I can ask around just to confirm internally um, if there's anything that, you know, any reason why we wouldn't be able to share the PowerPoint. And um, I'll take a note to, to both of you um, about sharing that out. So a question around a user asked today if Fusion is on the roadmap to replace Inventor since many of its uh, functions are very similar. Um, you know, that's a, an interesting question. It's a difficult question. Uh, you know, a lot of new technology is going into Fusion. You know, that is a, a platform that we are uh, investing heavily in. Um, you know, I, I, I don't immediately foresee anything where we're replacing Inventor with, with Fusion, um, you know, in the short term, given the the breadth and capability and, and dependency that the people have today on, on Inventor. Um, a lot of new technology is being put into Fusion, and, and for the most part, where it stands today, um, it's a slightly different use case. So while there is feature overlap, um, you know, some of the, the rationale behind it is, is a little different. So you mentioned 3D printing as an option for uh, manufacturing. Is that primarily metals or is it plastic supported? Um, it's a good question. So what we have in today is is specific to overhang angles. So it's not not specific to a given uh, printing method, uh, whether it's you know metals or plastics. Uh, obviously, there will be some structures that come out that may be more difficult from a plastic standpoint then from a, a metal standpoint, depending on what, you know, classification of plastic you mean, whether it's FDM um, or, or, or SLA or, you know, some other avenue. But um, yeah, it's not, not necessarily targeted specifically for, for metals. Uh, let me... Uh, is there a specific link to find other generative case studies? I'd like to check for more generative design projects. Um, that one, I, I, I do believe we have a, a whole page dedicated to that. I can I can uh, dig that up and and send it out as well. Uh, with 3D printing, can you add constraints such as maximum angles and overhangs? I, I mentioned that one, so yes, you can specify. Uh, actually, I can show that here while we're we are um, talking. Let me close that back out. So manufacturing. So as we get in, you, you can specify the overhang angle as well as the the minimum thickness. Um, are you able to import models into Fusion, or does the model need to be native to the software? Um, absolutely, you can import import models into Fusion. So uh, Fusion has a, a broad capability of importing different CAD models. Um, you can you can import them and take it straight into the, the Fusion generative space. Um, is it possible to make a design through CFD? Um, so at this point, we don't have, um, we'll say, a generative fluids, if that's where the question is, is going to. It's something that we're definitely looking at. Um, if there is, you know, we'll say we have had a number of people that have used generative for um, hydraulic components where, where there is a, a fluid aspect to it or, or even say like on the PowerPoint presentation, the, uh, the brake caliper itself, you know, there, there are aspects from a, a thermal perspective. So the geometry that we get out 
from from generative design can be taken to you know CFD to be uh, you know tested and confirmed from a from a prototyping standpoint there. Um, where can I find training for generative design? So uh, there's a number of spots that you can learn the tool. Um, you know, in product there is a, a help that will guide you through. Um, you know, using you know portions of it. We do have a a really nice outline and and discussion as well as even highlighting details of fusion um, within the design academy. Um, but but realistically, I would say you know for for that as a whole, um, if you want to answer yes in the survey, uh, we can reach out to you and, and kind of talk about some of the different options that you have available to you. And one of my peers added the link around the different uh, case studies, so thank you for that. Um, can this be used in the building industry for concrete, steel, and wood structures? Um, that's an interesting one. Um, to, I mean, obviously from the steel perspective, but um, Mike, do you want to comment a little bit more on perhaps trying to use this for like a, a concrete component? Yeah, um, I was thinking about that one too. Um, I think that the obviously the steel isn't an issue right because we're talking about ultimately some sort of part design um and and that material exists wood to an extent right uh, wood is a orthotropic material uh and currently um i think everything that's in there is an isotropic material so you know we run into that same thing I, I have more of a, a structural simulation background and uh, when when we choose or when people choose not to leverage something orthotropic generally what we do is you know choose the the weaker of the material properties to make it uh, what do you want to say a conservative solution I guess um, concrete is is not uh, to the best of my knowledge one of the materials that you can leverage in there but uh i would say this uh i think that maybe one of the mm, one of the ultimate goals would be the uh safety of the structure right the the safety of the outcome um so what i would maybe do is use a material some material that's in the library just so you could perform the simulation right and the goal of the simulation is for it to come up with these different designs uh, and then like you showed in the, the video demonstration you could promote that design uh, out of generative design and then once you have that you could take that into a a simulation and do a um, uh, some sort of uh, uh, follow-up structural simulation analysis to make sure that it's it's strong enough in tension and compression you know things like that so while the generative design itself might not accommodate the material once you get it out of generative design for simulation what you're dealing with then is the geometry itself i mean it does bring in the materials uh presuming that you're going to either we have a export tansis module and and we also have the ability to export it right back to fusion simulation. So once you get it to either of those, there's no reason that you couldn't change the material, and, uh, at least to validate the, the structural integrity of the, the outcome. So uh, I would say generative design for the generation of the, the shape, the solution of the shape, and then uh, post-process with some, some different simulation. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, there's another one here. Uh, any advice in simplifying T-spline? Um, I, 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 so I'd be curious if you could elaborate a little bit more as far as uh, the ask around simplifying T-spline. So um, as as we promote this back into Fusion as a as a component as a body, um, you know, we have the ability to 
to modify that geometry, we have a full history, um, you know, with that with that body, you know, as it goes from mesh to B rep. And so, so yeah, you have the ability to modify that that T spine as needed in case you know there are um, some regions that you're you know not uh, comfortable with, or if you know as you like if we're diving into to this one here. You know, if I didn't like this little divot that exists, you know, from a T-spine body, I'd be able to to kind of pull that back out um, and have it smoothed over. Um, so, if you can elaborate a little bit more as far as you know your context of of simplifying, you know, the T-spine, um, you know, we might be able to answer that a little bit better. One other question was, uh, you know, if I design something, can I 3D print it quickly, or do I need another software um, to, for for print prep? That's a good question. Um, you know, we have more recently added new capabilities within the uh, manufacturer workspace. Um, so you have the ability, if you have a part that you would like to to take, kind of going to the prior question as well around the. Um, you know whether this is just for metals or plastics. You know if there is a part that you would like to print, uh, you can bring it into the manufacturer workspace. And you know now we Fusion has a full you know print prep capabilities and can do full slicing um, of geometry as well. So, any any other questions? I have one. <laughs> All right. Can you show us quickly? We are right now reviewing some of the outcomes. Could you go into mm -hmm. the setup environment yeah. uh, and maybe show us the the manufacturing methods that are available. Sometimes, you know, it goes yeah. kind of quick in the video and it's, I know it's one of the areas that people are really interested in, so. Yeah, so, you know, as as Mike mentioned, um, you know, there, there are, uh, you know, for the a priori, you know, costing aspects, we can set, uh, you know, what our intended production volume would be. Uh, we have unrestricted the additive, so if you know, you know, for your geometry um, to become like a, a supportless design, you know, for a given orientation, uh, you have a given overhang angle that you're looking to maintain, you know, what's the minimum thickness that you can handle. Um, and then from a milling perspective, the two and a half, three and five axis, um, you know, what the tool direction is. Uh, what the you know head diameter, tool diameter, so that, that we know you know for the tool itself, you know how can it, how far it can reach, um, before clashing with the the head itself. And as you hover over, I'll give it there a second. You know we give a little tool tip so that you can kind of see what we're what we're trying to represent. Um, and then we can get into two axis cutting as well. So if you want to look at uh, if this was a you know perhaps a, a sheet metal part. Um, and you wanted to, to kind of look at different intricate designs, you could, you know, enable two axis cutting uh, and then die casting. Um, so you have a number of different options. You can, you know, include one or, or a number of them. Uh, I'd say typically my recommendation would be, um, you know, it costs the same to, to run it with one manufacturing method as, as all the potential ones that you might ever consider and even not consider. So you might as well, you know, look at a number of different con you know, manufacturing methods just so that you can get an understanding of, you know, how that how that load might go through uh, that potential space between your preserved regions. So it says, for aesthetic reasons, is it possible to enforce symmetry if possible? Um, that's a great question. Uh, and that's actually a kind of a timely question. So there, there are a lot of internal discussions happening right now around that. So, um, you know, as it stands today, uh, there isn't a, 
a current box or you know feature to turn on to say you know enforce symmetry for aesthetic purposes. Um, but it is something that our our development team and our, our product management team have um, had active discussions here in the last you know couple of weeks around um, if it is you know how what the best workflow for that would be you know what's the expectation from a user perspective when you want symmetry versus not um, and and how that kind of gets incorporated into the you know the algorithm for the geometry yep <laughs> i kind of <laughs> want to expand upon that but i don't know that i want to lengthen it more so in my opinion if, imagine, I can't remember if the original uh, arm hair was symmetric or not. I think it was slightly, slightly off. Yeah, it was it slightly off. off. But imagine slightly. that the, the one towards the front end there was mirrored, the short uh, stub, if you will, towards the right top there, if it was also mirrored on the bottom. Um, oh yeah, we're even off a little bit there towards the rear of the geometry too. But uh, envisioning that it were, um, you know, I don't see any reason why you couldn't uh, add in, let's see here, that would be like an XZ plane uh, and cut away half the geometry either above in the positive Y direction or in the minus Y direction. And then what I think you could do is add in a large um, avoidance region so that it doesn't build anything in that negative space. So ultimately what it would produce, it would be half of the outcome that you really need. And then once you, you know, uh, promote or export the outcome, uh, you could always uh, mirror it within the, the fusion design space as well. Just something that came to me while uh, Apollo and I were on a presentation not long ago regarding the, uh, the symmetry tools that are forthcoming within the program. But I, I think certainly there are means by which you could do it today. Uh, and it'll only get easier from there. So I haven't done it myself. I just haven't had the opportunity, but I, I would love to see somebody, somebody go for it. I think it's a, maybe we should create a video on it. Yeah. <laughs> Give myself work to do. <laughs> I totally understand yeah. where that question's coming from. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Any any final questions? I, I I know we still have you know Mike and I are happy to to hang out um, you know and, and chat if there are further questions. But I am conscious that uh, you know there are other things that people need to do today, and um, I don't want to keep you if there are no other questions that uh, you guys have to ask today. Okay. Not seeing well, anything else. Yeah, not seeing any anything new. So, you know, in that in that sense, guys, I appreciate everybody joining um, wherever you are based out of. And um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, this is being recorded. It will it will be posted. So if you want to review it, um, and um, yeah, don't forget to respond to the survey if you'd like us to reach out to have maybe a little bit more one-on-one -on -one discussion around its capabilities and next steps. Right. Appreciate everybody joining. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.